All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our um, speaker tonight for our colorectal education series, Dr. Sean Langenfeld. Um, Dr. Langenfeld is an associate professor in section chief of colorectal surgery in the Department of General Surgery at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. Uh, he attended medical school at St. Louis University uh, School of Medicine and then general surgery training at the University of Kansas in Wichita. He went on to pursue colorectal surgery at the University of Texas in Houston. Um, Dr. Langenfeld is very involved in um, our colorectal society. Uh, he is also on various um, editorial boards, including the Journal of Surgical Education, Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery, and is currently the section editor of the Selected Abstracts for uh, the Diseases in Colon and Rectum. Tonight, he's going to be talking to us about um, controversies in diverticulitis and management of diverticulitis, which is an important topic for every colorectal surgeon and colorectal trainee. So with that, thank you again, Dr. Langenfeld, for joining us, and uh, we'll let you go ahead and share your screen. So, you got it. Just tell me if I'm doing it wrong. Boom. Is it working? It Good. is, yes. All right, we'll get started. So before I do anything else, I want to tell you guys, I want to compliment you guys on this, because uh, social media has become ingrained in surgical education. And it's nice to have a product like this that's organized and kind of vetted and verified versus just sort of uh, whatever some dummy in Polo's Facebook group says, uh, if that makes sense. So uh, I don't have any disclosures other than I need more followers on Twitter. So if you guys don't follow me, please start doing it, um, trying to get up to 4,000. I'm not that close yet. So I was going to cut and paste a bunch of stuff. On diverticulitis initially when I thought about this topic you know etiology it's going to talk about nuts seeds and popcorn all that crap but but the reality is because of the audience you know I think that we can dive into a little bit more controversy a little more detail a little more sophisticated discussion um so I try to ask myself what questions about diverticulitis remain in 2022 so the first one I asked myself is who's doing diverticulitis compared to 20 years ago and I wrote a paper with Dr. Thompson. Do all Hinchy 2 patients need elective surgery? If not, what happens if you observe them? Should we treat immunocompromised patients differently? Should we be more aggressive? Should we have a lower threshold for elective surgery or emergency surgery in that population? And should we give antibiotics for uncomplicated disease? What about if there's a small pair called abscess? We'll see if I can change your mind about that by in this talk. And then uh, what's the threshold for like comp uh, colectomy and uncomplicated disease? And then ultimately, I thought that was enough questions for Sunday night. I didn't do the last one for you, but uh, I'm happy to discuss the last one, in, in which you guys want to talk about later on. So first, who's doing surgery for diverticulitis 2022? There's a decent amount of literature on this, but it all relies upon statewide databases for the most part. This New York State all-pair database uh, sampled from 2000 to 2014 looked at this uh, and found that about 10,000 patients underwent either urgent or emergent surgery. And of those group, 98% had a heart procedure, less than 2% had a primary anastomosis with or without approximate diversion. Uh, looking at specialty, colorectal surgeons performed about 6% of these operations. And you can see that number is, went up over the course of the, of the database timeframe, 2.4% in 2000 versus 12% in 2014. The patients had similar baseline demographics, um, but colorectal had a bigger share of the quote unquote urgent cases, which we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Just looking at the outcomes from this study, colorectal surgeons are much more likely to perform an anastomosis, a whopping 4.2% of the time, and more likely to use a laparoscopic approach. But there is no difference in the adjusted post operative morbidity. And that's pretty important. Um, unfortunately, there was a difference in the post operative mortality, regardless of the surgical approach. And so, it, Based on this, looks like colorectal surgery is doing a little bit better. Um, this is something in the Florida inpatient discharge data set 2015 to 12,000 patients. Again, a small percentage of the, of the surgery is being performed by colorectal surgeons. Much more likely to use laparoscopy. But there's no difference in complication rates for urgent emergent cases. The reason this is important is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's very safe to have a general surgeon or a trauma surgeon do an emergency surgery for diverticulitis in 2022. Uh, they did that same Florida database, same author, different study, uh, but they looked at elective cases, smaller end here, it's almost 6,000. In elective cases, colorectal clearly performs a lot more uh, than they do emergent. So we do about 26% of the elective surgery diverticulitis, much more likely to use laparoscopy, 
And the high volume surgeons had lower rates of complications, but the complications were similar between general surgery and colorectal. So if you're a high volume general surgeon, you could demonstrate similar outcomes. Uh, what about across the ponds? So this is a study uh, in the Lothian region of the UK, uh, looking at outcomes before and after colorectal surgeons took over the emergent diverticulitis care. And they showed decreased mortality, decreased tumor formation, increased anastomosis, and no comments on the complication rates. Uh, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. I just want you guys to know all the data. This is just more, this is looking at uh, three academic centers. And in this one, the colored surgeons did a lot more of the surgeries. They had more dominance on the, the referral patterns. And again, you can see that uh, the outcomes are better for the colored surgeon. The most recent one, this one just popped up in my uh, search a couple of days ago. It's a single center retrospective review of colostomy takedowns in elective surgery over four years, 127 surgeries, about half and half uh, colorectal versus the uh, acute care surgery team uh, performing the procedure. Similar patient demographics and diagnoses. Um, but what you'll see is that colorectal surgeons were associated with a lower rate of anastomotic leak, uh, lower rate of intradominal abscess, lower rate of surgical site infection. Um, so knowing that, does specialization impact outcomes? Yeah, volume dictates proficiency in most literature present here, and the other one that I didn't present suggests colorectal surgeons are going to have better outcomes uh, for emergent and elective surgery, but you, you have to qualify that because, well, first of all, we handle more complicated case patients at baseline, most likely. A disease is a little more complex, which might impact outcomes, but you really can't compare these groups. It's, fairly, it's unfair to the general surgeon to compare them that way because the colorectal surgeon is maybe not the difference. Maybe he's a marker for the fact that the case is less emergent, that the hospital is a larger hospital with a higher volume uh, center where a closure surgeon would actually uh, have privileges. And then there's patients with more resources in these groups too. The literature exploits the data a little bit and kind of the general surgeon is much more likely to be doing these cases at midnight in a facility with less resources. Only 6% of these emergencies are done by colon surgeons. And so I think you have to be really careful with adjusted data trying to figure out the difference. I, I think it's comparing apples to oranges, but there is some important implications for the future. And that's what I thought was interesting uh, since a lot of people I assume are still training. Uh, more non-operative management of complicated diverticulitis is occurring these days, significantly more. And that reduces the residents' experience in these kind of emergent cases. Additionally, because there's more self-specialization, especially in training environments, and there's fellows, et cetera, it's possible that the residents aren't getting as much exposure to these laparoscopic cases as they were when everything was being done open and being done by a general surgeon. There's a couple of studies to look at here. Um, this is an old study from 2002. And back then, this is data that I quoted in the study I about lap colon intersections in the past. But you can see here that for a general surgeon reapplying for his uh, general surgery board research, uh, if you did a, a mean of two colostomy closures a year, and about 11 colons a year, if you did 14 colons, you were 70th percentile, 23 colons, 90th percentile for general surgery. This is a second study looking at rural surgeons that came out just a few years ago. And you can see here uh, significantly low numbers. Basically in rural surgery, uh, the average rural surgeon did uh, about seven colons a year and most of them were open. And you can see the same thing down here. Most general surgeons are doing a handful of colons a year. And the ones that they're doing are the less favorable ones. They're not teed up, they're, they're happening at 2 a.m. The learning curve for lap colon is about 50 to 60 cases in the literature. And so I think it's crucial that we uh, receive adequate training before we graduate. Because once you're in practice, you're probably not going to complete the learning curve on a complex procedure like that. Uh, if we don't do that, the future's going to hold more impressive differences in outcomes, which isn't good for anybody. So I, uh, residents know me personally, probably think this sounds silly coming out of my mouth. I really don't think we should uh, focus on you know, how great colon surgeons are taking out colons, I think it'd be better uh, focused on uh, how to prepare general surgery graduates for safe emergency colectomies without a fellowship. Uh, currently, the outcomes are fine, but if the disparity keeps happening and who's doing what, then it might get worse. So moving on. Do all Hinchy 2 patients need elective surgery? We all agree to public abscess can receive a percutaneous or interventional radiology during an acute setting. Very rarely people on, on this Zoom call are gonna take that person to the OR if they've got a, a stable exam. But when these patients have complicated diverticulitis, uh, should we routinely be going forward six plus weeks later and performing an elective laparoscopic colectomy, or can we be more selective individualized in our decision-making? If you go back to the practice parameters of 2014 from DCR, uh, 
Uh, there's Dr. Steele right there. And, and what they say very clearly is elective colectomy should typically be considered when they've had an abscess because there's recurrence rate of 40%, all this type of stuff. And so basically the old textbooks all said a single episode of complicated diverticulitis and they need a colectomy. But this is the more recent chapter in the third edition. This is probably the textbook that you guys have. Jason Hall is a thought leader in diverticulitis. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met, but he also, uh, you know, started to dive into the fact that this is actually a little bit more nuanced. Maybe we should make in these decisions on a case by case basis uh, rather than uh, having sort of a universal uniform approach. And so the whole idea of monitoring these patients and not doing like the surgery probably started with Morris Franklin. I, I, he's passed away recently. I don't know if a lot of you guys know who he is. He's a very famous sort of uh, pioneer in laparoscopic surgery. And he had 18 patients in this case series with two abscesses that went laparoscopic lavage and drainage. And he had to follow up with months and 15 of them out of the 18 remained asymptomatic without resection. So he's one sort of push the envelope initially. This is a study that came out about seven or eight years ago. The authors had to wait through a lot of heterogeneous data, but what they found was that there were 28% recurrence rate after non-operative management of diverticulitis uh, and about 1% presented with a free perforation requiring emergency surgery. Um, what that means is that, yeah, the recurrence rate is high at 28%, but the recurrence is typically mirroring the pattern of the first attack, and very rarely do they come back with a surgical emergency. For patients who were not offered interval surgery, 18% developed recurrence, 49% uncomplicated, 34% recurrent abscess, only 3% of recurrences were a surgical emergency. This is some data from uh, USC. I don't know if you guys know Paul Colon. He's uh, uh, sort of been my partner in crime over the last 10 years. Uh, but they looked through a lot of data, and unfortunately, they reported really high rates of recurrence, 60.5%, and a higher rate of emergency surgery as well. So it's a little bit of mixed data. And then this study came out in 2017, retrospective single center review, uh, excluding patients who died within the year and who received elective surgery later on. What you can see here is about 180 improved, about 81 of those uh, didn't go on to have surgery. And the 52 who did that had about 10% recurrence rate and no surgical emergencies. And so certainly in select patients, the history of public abscess, you don't have to do an operation. So just the most recent words, British Journal of Surgery 2018, they did a meta-analysis of what they considered low quality evidence, but I thought it was kind of rude considering Kyle was an author on those papers. But uh, basically what they're showing is that you just don't have to do it. So just summarizing, 32% of patients in the non-operative arm developed recurrent diverticulitis and mean pulp of 35 months. All recurrences were in air and or abscess and all were managed operatively nobody required emergency surgery in that, set, in that series. So the take-home points, most patients are going to improve with antibiotics for cancer, and you know that. If you have a single episode of pinch to diverticulitis, your recurrence after that is about 30 to 40 percent, so higher than what we'd see with uncomplicated diverticulitis. But the need for emergency surgery is likely about 1 percent. So you can offer it elective surgery, but don't do it with the intent of preventing a future stomach, because that's not a reasonable goal of care. Next, should we treat immunocompromised patients more aggressively? So just for background, immunosuppression has a significant impact on wound healing and patient tolerance to severe sepsis. Management of diverticulitis, this patient population has evolved in recent years because we understand the disease better. So my experience as a resident on the transplant service, just being honest with you guys, granted this was a while ago, but we did screening colonoscopies on all our patients prior to our transplants. And if they had diverticulosis, not diverticulitis, but just the presence of diverticuli, we were doing prophylactic open signal weak colectomies on them because once they're immunocompromised, you got to worry about them dying of sepsis. And this was a common practice in transplant surgery in the early 2000s. So just talking about who's immunosuppressed, uh, I mean, you can see this group uh, is pretty well-defined, poorly controlled HIV, people on active chemotherapy, people on high-dose corticosteroids, and then the one that you, you'll probably see the most if you're kind of uh, out in practice is people that have had solid organ transplants. That's where I'm gonna focus today. There's a lot of uh, literature on this. Um, and so if you want three studies to sort of help understand immunosuppression and diverticulitis, these are the three studies that you should look at, which is why I'm putting here on the screen uh, in case you want a screenshot or something like that. First of all, when it comes to instant diverticulitis, we know about 1% of immunocompromised patients get diverticulitis. That's about 8% of immunocompromised patients 
that have diverticulosis. Now think back to all those prophylactic uh, open colons I did when I was resident. Age of presentation is pretty similar in incompetent patients and symptoms are also pretty similar in incompetent patients. They vary depending on disease severity. So about 40% of patients with immunosuppression present with complicated disease. That's a pretty high number. That's compared to less than 25% for normal patients. More than 30% of these patients require emergency surgery. This is all retrospective data. We don't have good threshold for who gets surgery. Obviously, the probably the trigger for emergency surgery is going to be a little quicker in the immunosuppressed patient. The problem is mortality from emergency surgery in this patient population is about 20 to 40%. That's really high. I saw one study as high as 50%. I looked at the more recent data and the probably the real number is 20%. The 20% mortality from emergency colon surgery is pretty dang high. So that's something we're trying to avoid. Overall mortality from complicated diverticulitis is about 20, 25%. You compare that to immunocompetent patients where the mortality from complicated diverticulitis is less than 3%. You can see why the old recommendations were to have a low threshold for elective surgery in this population. For patients managed conservatively for complicated disease, there's a recurrence rate of about 46%. And just to single up, un unlike the slides I just showed you for Hinchy 2 stuff, immunocompetent patients, in this patient population, up to 75% of these people require urgent surgery on their recurrence. What this means is that if you have an immunocompromised patient who has complicated disease and they get better with conservative management, 100% that patient should have an elective sigmoid blood, um, without a doubt, based on the current uh, data available. What about uncomplicated diverticulitis. We know that patients with complicated diverticulitis do poorly. The mortality of emergency surgery is high, recurrence is high, but we also know that these people present with uncomplicated disease, at least, you know, 60% of the time. And initial non-operative management is known to be safe for, you know, compromised patients with uncomplicated disease. So if you look at old practice parameters, this isn't that old, it's just a, the, the one right before the one just came out, but very clearly it says surgeons should maintain a low threshold to recommend operative intervention as definitive treatment during the first hospitalization and for these patients. So looking at uncomplicated disease in a little bit more detail, uh, the overall recurrence rate after a single uncomplicated attack in immunocompromised patients, about 20, 25%. That's pretty similar to a uh, immunocompetent patient. The risk of second recurrence is about 5%. So 25% of people that have had a recurrence are gonna have another recurrence. We'll talk about that later, but it's the same as immunocompetent patients. Here's a study of 2012, largest case series you can find people with diverticulitis, 166. And they had patients with mild disease. Uh, they had about a 14% risk of recurrent disease. Only 9% required urgent surgery. The first attack is a worst attack, applies immunocompromised patients as well. So if you look at the more uh, updated uh, guidelines from the ASCRS, what you're gonna see now is they've kind of pulled back a little bit. And so the decision to offer sigmoid colectomy after recovery from uncomplicated disease should be individualized, which is very similar to what you do in an immunocompetent individual. So that being said, no matter what you do, elective surgery is still needed in some of these patients if they've got recurrent disease, smoldering disease, et cetera. So if you look at that, uh, including uh, elective surgery after a complicated attack, this is a, a great uh, NISQIP study done uh, by some people uh, from Canada uh, that I've worked with in the past, Dr. Boutros and Dr. Gordon. 736 immunocompromised patients undergoing elective surgery. And if they're doing elective surgery in this patient population, the mortality is about 2% and morbidity is about 25%. That's significantly higher than the morbidity and mortality of immunocompetent patients. If you're very careful with these patients, um, especially wound dehiscence being a big problem. So if you have to pull the trigger on an immunocompromised patient, what well, can you do? So first of all, if they're on Rapimune, what I would tell you guys is that the Rapimune has to be stopped. In the history of all the transplant patients I've operated on electively, this has never been a problem. The transplant, whatever, hepatologist or nephrologist has always been able to find a different immunosuppressive drug. Rapimune has a profound effect on wound healing. Why they put it on stents? Because it doesn't get uh, thrombosed. And so additionally, You'll find sometimes they're on these fixed doses of prednisone that can actually be weaned down if you just talk to the talk to the medical docs. And then uh, it's okay to continue things like Prograf or uh, Myfortic, and there's really no major impact on wound healing with that. As far as liver transplants, whenever you're doing a surgery on a patient like that, the anatomy varies pretty significantly comparing a RU and Y uh, versus a duct to duct anastomosis for the transplant. So you need to anticipate that and read the road op note. Uh, look for upper abdominal adhesions. I probably wouldn't use left water as a varus in these patients. I've gotten in lots of different ways, but, but this is a, one of the few times where I like to do uh, kind of a Hassan technique at the umbilicus. 
kidney transplants are typically entirely extraperitoneal, but not always. Uh, and so keep that in mind. You may not even really see anything other than the kidney kind of pushing in on you from the, from the right lower quadrant. Interestingly, though, uh, if you're using a fan steel incision, you got to be really careful because you could end up compromising kind of where that kidney's at if you make it big enough. Native kidneys tend to make a little bit of urine. So if you're going to do the surgery, even though they've got a transplant, you probably ought to put some stents in those native ureters as well. If you don't, you can end up with urinoma. Uh, as the case goes well, these patients don't typically require like a loop ileostomy routinely. That being said, you should always have a low threat of a loop ileostomy. That's a lot of information to cover. I'm going to take a swig of my drink here. Right on target, though, I have tons of time to talk. Um, the next topic is kind of an emotional one. And that's about whether or not we should be giving antibiotics for uncomplicated disease. So I'm going to present you with a kind of a case here. You have an otherwise healthy 57-year-old man who presents to the emergency room with uncomplicated sigmoid diverticulitis. He's got localized pain. He's tolerating POL. His white count is 14. He's being discharged to home. In your current practice, realistically, you're probably going to give this guy augmentin or ciproflagyl for some arbitrary amount of days, some multiple of five or seven, you know, whatever your attending tells you to do. But I'm gonna try over the next five to 10 minutes to convince you that that is not necessary. So, microperforation infection of long and thought to cause diverticulitis. That's why antibiotic therapy is surgical dogma, at least in the United States. But there's new theories emerging, focusing on a primary inflammatory process, which is kind of similar to IBD. So the need for antibiotics and uncomplicated diverticulitis has been challenged, especially in Europe over the last 10 years. I gave a talk on the ASCRS podium in 2016 on this. And what I kind of said at the time uh, was the jury is still out and on antibiotics from complicated diverticulitis. And that fit with the practice parameters. Uh, the practice parameters back then said further research is required before adopting an antibiotic free strategy. But a lot has uh, kind of accumulated since then, it's getting harder to ignore. There's a lot of high quality studies with long term follow up showing that antibiotics are not necessary for uncomplicated diverticulitis. So I'm going to go over three randomized controlled trials. Uh, the big one, AVOD trial, 2012, sparked the debate. Everybody's talking about it. Diabolo, 2017, everybody's waiting for the results of this trial. This answered a lot of lingering questions that came from the AVOD trial. And then the Dynamo trial, which just popped within the last few months, they answered one lingering question about where you can treat them. So I'll discuss functional outcomes as well. But we need to kind of define uncomplicated disease for, the, for this. And so anybody that knows kind of my dating history from high school, I think things could be more complicated uh, than they seem. But for this, what I would say is that defining uncomplicated disease is acute chronic inflammation limited to the colon wall and adjacent tissue, absence of free perforation, no pelvic abscess, no fistula, no obstruction. That being said, if you have a small pericolic abscess, not a pelvic abscess, but a pericolic abscess, that's Hinchy 1B, that's uncomplicated. Uh, for the most part. Uh, Neil Smart disagrees with me on this. So I, I don't think he's on the call though, so I can say whatever I want. Now, the AVOD study, 2012, this is a multi-center Swedish randomized controlled trial, 623 patients with CT confirmed, very important, CT confirmed uncomplicated diverticulitis. Group one got admitted, they got antibiotics for seven days. Group two got admitted and all they got were IV fluids. There was no significant difference between the two groups in treatment failure, no difference in pain, no difference in progression to complicated disease, length of stay, or recurrence of the year. Basically, it doesn't make a difference. The reason that's important is people go, oh, well, the antibiotics can make you feel better quicker, or it's going to prevent the recurrence. It's not true. It doesn't make a difference in any of the measured categories we're looking at. Now, this study included 10 centers. It occurred over seven years and had issues with low accrual of eligible patients, which is common when somebody has an acute disease that you're treating and trying to randomize people. Additionally, 40% of these episodes were recurrent. The reason that's important is we already know that the first attack is the worst attack, right? In diverticulitis. And so they've already had an attack that was uncomplicated. They've kind of declared themselves as benign. And so maybe this was a milder group, you know, a highly selected group. That being said, the same authors who had published two or more case series showing a 95% success rate for observation with antibiotics. So this sort of really sparked the debate about this. And Moving forward, though, we were all kind of waiting for the Diabolo trial that got published about five years ago. This is a multi-center randomized control trial from the Netherlands comparing antibiotics observation. And every one of these patients was a first episode, indexed episode of acute uncomplicated left side diverticulitis. Again, all the cases were CT proven. Now, they included the Hinchy 1B in here. Uh, so Hinchy 1B, the small pericolic abscess, was still randomized. 
eight percent of the cohort uh, had this. Ultimately, they had the same outcomes as HIMSS one a but I don't want to jump too far ahead on that. They had 528 patients randomized. And what you can see from this is one of the early kind of uh, when we were just trying to figure out uh, visual abstracts. So I apologize, I was kind of busy. But look at all these different outcomes. No difference in complication rates, need for surgery, time to recovery, recurrence, or readmission. Again, the antibiotics didn't help in any of the measured categories. They came back with two-year follow-up. So this is a study that came out uh, later on, just revisiting these Diabolo patients. And what they found, the initial trial only had 12 months of follow-up. They came back with two years of follow-up to determine if there's any difference in secondary outcomes, which is recurrent diverticulitis, complicated diverticulitis, or need for emergent electric flectomy. Now, it was not powered for these secondary outcomes. That is important to say. The study is not powered to determine if antibiotics impact the rate of complicated articulitis. Just showing you the data here, though. They had follow-up in a surprisingly large number of the patients in both of these arms, and there was no difference in recurrence, yeah, progression to complicated disease, need for emergency surgery, or need for elective surgery. Fascinating to me when I read this. This is just a kind of... A, a summary of this, you can see at two years, interestingly, the recurrence rate was about 15%. That's pretty low compared to the other kind of reported recurrence rates that you might see in the literature. CT proven recurrence was even lower than that. So I think a lot of these people are one and done, if that makes sense, especially if they present with uncomplicated disease. Less than 5% presented with complicated recurrence. That's, you know, your fistula or your pelvic abscess. So the first tag is the worst tag for 95% of patients. And interestingly, looking here, the risk of them having an uncomplicated episode, getting antibiotics or not getting them, doesn't matter, and then progressing to a surgical emergency was about 1%. So not very common. And you can see the rate of elective colectomy is pretty low in both these groups too. So basically these patients do well without surgery. Now, the big question I sort of had after that is, okay, well, all these patients are admitted to the hospital and given IV fluids, it's still an intervention. Is that necessary? Or can they go home? So in the Ebola trial, 87% of observation patients were admitted to the hospital. AVOD, every single patient was admitted to the hospital. But they've had two more studies from the AVOD group where everybody was treated as an outpatient and they had equivalent outcomes. So I think they can be treated as an outpatient for the most part. Uh, the criteria for admission should probably mirror that of the criteria you would give uh, for somebody that's receiving antibiotics. This is a more recent study that came out, Dynamo study. This just got published recently. Um, prospective non-inferiority trial across 15 centers in Catalonia, Spain. And what they're looking at is CT proven uncomplicated diverticulitis. They see these patients in the ER and they're gonna go home from the ER. So on the way home from the ER, they randomized them to either seven days of Augmentin plus ibuprofen and Tylenol or just ibuprofen and Tylenol alone. Primary endpoint was hospital admissions. Basically, if you send them home, do the antibiotics impact the chance of them coming back to the hospital? Big question when you're a resident, it's 2 a.m. and you're annoyed by the patient that came in. So they did clinical exams at 2, 7, 30, 90 days. Over four years, they randomized about 360, or I'm sorry, they had 849 patients that came in with uncomplicated disease, and they had to exclude almost 400 of these patients from their trial. Reasons here, no antibiotics in the last two weeks, no diverticulitis the last three months. These were the criteria they had to meet. They, they weren't allowed to have significant more comorbidities. And they can only have one of the following. They can only have a fever of 38, or a white count of 12, or a heart rate over 90, or a rest rate over 20, or CRP over 15. So if they had two of these, they were excluded. What that means is these are cherry picked. These are the least sick patients possible. That being said, they did well, they did a good job of matching the two arms. And what you're gonna see here with the data is that when you send these people home from the ER, about 7% are gonna come back to the ER a second time. And that leads to an admission rate of about three to 6%. And 0% of these people, none of them, end up needing emergency surgery. So it's a very safe thing to do to send them home from the ER. And this is looking at poor pain control. And you can see that that's sort of something that they didn't talk about much in, in the earlier studies on this. And you can see that the, the pain scores were identical between people that didn't, didn't receive antibiotics. Now, this thing had a million limitations. I'll just tell you that. It's in the annals of surgery. But they didn't differentiate index from recurrent episodes. It was not blinded and it was not placebo controlled. So they knew who, who was getting what. The patients knew it too. They don't have any long-term data. They also don't have any quality of life data. They excluded a lot of people with uncomplicated disease. So I, you know, I don't take too much from the Dynamo trial other than it's clear that these patients can be treated at home. They don't have to be admitted to the hospital. Now, pericolic abscesses. Keep in mind, they were excluded from the Dynamo trial and from most case series. 
They by trial tried to exclude them, but when they went back and reevaluated CAD scans, they actually found 17 missed pericolic abscesses. They published their data on that. Interestingly, eight of those 17 were randomized to the observation arm, and all of those patients did well, if that makes sense. None of them had a uh, recurrence. Diabolo trial included Hinchy 1B patients. There's about 42% of them. That's 8% of the entire group. And their outcomes, again, were identical to Hinchy 1A. So the reason I bring that up is I'm saying you could probably even not give antibiotics to the guy that's got the the abscess in the colon wall. That one's viscerally harder for me to sit on, um, but that's the reality here. They got follow-up two years on 33 patients without any difference in the outcomes. This cohort's really too small to make a reliable conclusion, if that makes sense. This is just food for thought. Uh, for now, if you get a takeaway from this, what I would say is you have a patient with a, with a pericolic abscess, you probably need to give them antibiotics until you have a well-powered study showing that you're not, because they're excluded from most of the data on this. So who's gonna fail? Basically, if you send somebody home without antibiotics, who's going to have a hard time? Depends on your definition of failure. These guys define failure as a need for antibiotics. Well, if you send them home without antibiotics, about 8% are going to need antibiotics at some point during the follow-up period. And the big predictor of that is going to be a CRP over 170 or 17, depending on what type of a few grams per deciliter or not. In most series, patients who experience increasing pain, fevers, worsening leukocytosis received antibiotics, and that was about 3 to 4%. So progression is really low. And then uh, failure in this study, the 2017 study, was uh, progression to complicated disease, and that was very low. But interestingly enough, uh, if you had a pericolic abscess, your progression to complicated disease was higher. And then additionally, if you had a longer segment of brain colon, your risk was higher. So that's just some, something to keep in mind. Just a ton of more studies. I'm not going to go over all these. I'm just going to tell you that anytime there's a systematic review and meta-analysis on this, they all come from the same conclusion, which is essentially you don't need any. This is a more interesting study. This came out in uh, DCR more recently. And this is that same group, that Diabolo group, except instead of looking at recurrence, they're looking at more uh, kind of patient reported outcomes, uh, PROs, we call that, so functional outcomes and quality of life. And what you can see on the right-hand side here is that about a third of patients, regardless of whether they're in the antibiotic arm or in the uh, observation arm, about a third of them had persistent symptoms at one and two years after randomization. Now, the long-term quality of life was similar between the antibiotics and the observation groups, but you're looking at these symptoms, they're not exactly what you would expect when you could diverticulitis recurrence, fullness, bloating, flatulence, rumbling, severe urgency, diarrhea, fecal incontinence. I bring, I bring that up because I, as we get further into who should have surgery, I'm going to try to convince you that some of these patients that have what you'd consider like SUD or, uh, you know, uh, subacute uh, diverticular disease, maybe they basically have chronic smoldering symptoms. So that's all I'm going to talk about with the antibiotics. Another drink, we'll move on to the next topic. We've got a lot to cover tonight. What's the threshold for colectomy, an uncomplicated disease? You have your patient, they've had diverticulitis. How do you decide when you should do that real sweet robot sigmoid colon and pull the specimen out through the rectum? You're going to put ICG in the ureters instead of stents. You're going to record the whole thing, put it on Facebook. It's going to be amazing. How do you decide when to do it? Well, we know that non-operative management of acute uncomplicated articulitis works pretty much on everybody. That leaves you with a lot of patients. You need to know if and when they should have an elective sigmoid. In 2022, it's real easy to tell you when not to operate. Most of you guys know these reasons well. It's way harder to tell you when you should operate because there's honestly ongoing clinical equipoise in this area and there's significant disagreement uh, between experts. This is my actual Sabiston 17th edition textbook. You can see, I put my name on it. You can see that I like to highlight in three separate colors. And this is what I read when I was a resident. I read the whole Sabiston book twice during my residency. And what you can see here is back then they said, if you have a recurrent attack of diverticulitis, you've had two attacks, you should probably have an elective surgery. Same book also said that if you're under the age of 50, you should have elective surgery a little quicker. And obviously you can see the immunocompromised part here, which I highlighted to make sure that I didn't miss it. The first thing we have to look at, if we're gonna decide who's gonna get surgery, is what's the chance you're gonna have more attacks? So the recurrence rates after uncomplicated disease were previously overestimated. And the reason is more straightforward than you would think. A lot of people have left work quadrant pain. And sometimes the, the doc just gives them antibiotics for their quote-unquote diverticulitis and sends them on their way. They don't necessarily have CT scans to confirm it. 
the definitions of diverticulitis aren't clear. If you look at modern series, the recurrence rate is about 13, 34%. If you dissect that down even further, the best suggests just about one in four patients gonna have a second attack. Now, five to 12% are gonna have more than one attack. What that means is 25% of recurrent patients will have a second recurrence. Once you get past that second recurrence, you've had three, four, five attacks, the numbers go up and up from there. If you've had five or six attacks, you're probably gonna have more attacks in the future. That's the math on that. But diverticulitis is not a progressive disease. The first attack is usually the worst attack. The vast majority of emergency collections are performed for that patient's first episode of diverticulitis. So after an episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis, less than 5% are gonna have a complicated recurrence. We went over that a little bit with our data from the, the Ebola trial. So every time I give a talk on this, I have to bring this up. Uh, this is a very important thing because if you uh, start seeing these patients in your office, you're gonna hear them say, well, my primary doc says that I need to go have a colectomy because if I don't, I'm gonna end up with a colostomy bag. And, and that's just not a real reason to do surgery. After recovering from initial episode of diverticulitis, the risk of needing emergency surgery is one 2,000 patient years of follow-up. But that means that you have to do 18 colectomies to prevent one emergency surgery for diverticulitis. Now you think about that and then, you know, Rishi or Matt, think about my leak rate, which is about 15, 20%, right? Not, I hope it's less than five, but you can imagine there's a lot of complications after surgery. And so I don't think that doing surgery for prophylaxis is gonna stop anybody from having plastic. Thankfully, <laughs> my bias was supported by this great study that just came out recently. Uh, Dave Flum is considered a thought leader in diverticulitis as well, by the way. He's published a lot on that and on uh, diverticul or on appendicitis, excuse me. They did a retrospective database review of 12,000 patients from 2008 to 2014, treated as an inpatient for an index episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis. They compared rates of recurrent diverticulitis and a receipt of ostomy based on whether they got surgery or whether they were sent home with plans for observation rather than surgery. This is really interesting data. So just to dissect this a little bit, first and foremost, if they received an elective surgery that did reduce the risk of recurrent diverticulitis, I think that makes sense. You would hope. You would hope the surgery stops future episodes of diverticulitis, although the numbers weren't as good as you would think at 6, 12, and 15%. We might talk about that a little bit later. But interestingly, they did not reduce the risk of stoma. The increased stomas in the surgery group were largely due to complications. And so if you're doing surgery with the intent of preventing a stoma, you're achieving the opposite of your goal, if that makes sense. Revisiting the Ebola, we talked about this already, but just you know, looking at this, and putting it all in perspective, you can see why uh, that wouldn't help to prevent uh, an emergency surgery. So, so think about bad reasons to operate. First one, prevention of future hypothetical surgical emergency. We just talked about that. The other one, young age. Like I said, in my old textbook, it said if you're under the age of 50, you need to have surgery after one attack. And that was pretty much debunked. Age has no impact on incidents or severity of recurrences. What that means is a 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, you can get them the same counseling on whether they're gonna have more attacks in the future or not and what they're gonna be like. Age is a predictor of back pain and hair loss, as I can tell you guys, if you can see, if you zoom in a little closer on my, uh, my face. But solid organ immunotransplants, we talked about that already, so we're not gonna go into again. Those are bad reasons to operate. Another bad reason to operate is some arbitrary predetermined number of attacks. Does that make sense? And so. When I was a resident, it was two attacks. And then I read a study during residency that said, we did the math and actually it's three attacks. And about five years after that, another study came out and said, we did a cost analysis and it's four attacks. And what you're seeing is that the threshold for attacks goes up as you understand the disease better. If you get a little bit of pain, left lower quadrant, it gets better at three as a Cipro, you can have 40 attacks. Keep your colon for the rest of your life. I sleep like a baby. My favorite thing in the world to do is take out colons. I wouldn't do it. Another bad reason to do it. The old, oh, he travels a lot, or he lives in remote locations. And the reason I bring that up is that that's a main reason that a lot of people got elective surgeries because they're traveling. Keep in mind that rural Nebraska's got plenty of hospitals, antibiotics, and CT scanners, and these people's diseases already declared itself as uncomplicated. So you're not preventing a future surgical emergency. So that uh, indication for surgery is stupid. And then, of course, the worst reason to do it is so you can make a really cool video and put it on Facebook. 2020 uh, guidelines with side diverticulitis, the direct decision to recommend surgery should be individualized. And we're gonna talk about what that means here. So good reasons to operate. 
what you're seeing over time, and I think uh, Neil Smart says on Twitter just the other day in response to you know some tweet I put out about this talk, but this is very important actually. You should probably be focusing on these objective measures like recurrence or abscess size or length of disease. What you're thinking about is, does the patient feel better after you did surgery or not? Quality of life, patient reported outcomes. And that's probably more important than the CT findings, et cetera. So this is a, you know, that same study I showed you earlier. If you remember, I said one third of patients have persistent symptoms one and two years after randomization. And the symptoms kind of remind you of IBS, if that makes sense. Uh, this can be sort of summarized with what's called the gastrointestinal quality of life index, GIQLI. This is a 36 point GI specific validated health related quality of life measurement tool. And it's probably the best instrument we have to capture patient reported outcomes with diverticular disease. You can read those while I take a sip of uh, Gatorade Zero. Sexual function, stress, social interactions, activities of daily living. So it's a good reason to have surgery then. Well, the first one would be increased frequency attacks. They say, doc, they're not getting worse, but they're getting more frequent. I used to have attack every two or three years. Now I'm having one every two or three months. I feel like just as soon as I get over one attack, the next attack starts. That's what we call chronic smoldering diverticulitis. That's a good reason to do an elective surgery. Disabling attacks. I'm having severe pain with these attacks. I don't feel good. I'm requiring hospitalizations because I get nauseated every time I get diverticulitis and I can't eat for several days. It took me a month to feel better after the last attack. I'm constantly thinking about when it's going to happen again, and it's causing me concern and anxiety. Issues with finances, work, or social life. I've been in the ER five times this year. The hospitals are stacking up. I'm missing work too often. I'm afraid to travel. I missed my niece's wedding due to pain. These are all stories my patients have told me specifically. If you're wondering where this came from. Now, now that you know that, you should also know that patient factors matter, and that's okay. What I mean by that, if you've got a young and fit patient with a virgin abdomen, you can have a lower threshold for surgery. If you've got a patient that's morbidly obese who can't stop smoking, they've got heart disease, they're on steroids, their abdomen looks like this, it's okay to have a longer trial of observation because the risk to reward ratio is different in the patient on the left than it is from the patient on the right. This is just common sense. It'd be silly to apply the same reasoning to patients that are extremely different at baseline. And you can involve the patient in the decision. Ask them about the ongoing symptoms, give them the numbers, reassure them it's okay to wait if they're not ready to have surgery, but they can choose when they've had enough. And that's how you decide when to give people surgery to have people And the good news is when the time comes, if you decide to do a sigmoidectomy, the good news is it works. What I mean by that is once you've had a sigmoidectomy for diverticulitis, the risk of recurrence, having recurrent diverticulitis is about four to 6%. So it works. Long-term gastrointestinal quality of life is also improved. And this is just two studies that look at that, including five years follow-up with a direct trial. And so if you know you look at that same one I looked at, where is it at? No, I'm not going back to it. You know what I'm talking about. GI quality of life index, it's improved with that. This is a study from 2019, five-year data from the direct trial. 109 patients uncomplicated diverticulitis were randomized either observation or elective surgery if they had ongoing abdominal complaints or they had a history of two episodes in the last two years. What they found in the study was that surgery associated with significantly higher disease-specific quality of life scores in five years. Five years later after surgery, they still had persistent improvements in quality of life compared to observation. Of the 56 patients that were randomized observation, 46% of them eventually had a colectomy because of ongoing symptoms. And so certainly these people should be getting surgery sometimes. This is just some uh, data on recurrent diverticulitis. How do you convert predict? After you've had a resection, who's going to have recurrent diverticulitis? If you really want to read one, probably this bottom one is the most relevant uh, for you guys. What you're going to find is if you've done a colectomy for diverticulitis, the old studies looked at about a 10% risk of recurrence, of which 3% had reoperation. The most widely quoted data comes from this. If you say you got a 10% risk of recurrence, 5% risk of reoperating because of that recurrence. But the reality is that's probably overestimated. More, more a uh, modern study from Cleveland Clinic was 5% recurrence and a less than 1% reoperation rate. Mean time to recurrence was about 78 months. In the Netherlands, 2008, they had a study, 8.7% recurrence, the mean follow-up was 7.2 years. The most recent study that I could find was 2020. They had a less than 5% recurrence with a 0.3% reoperation rate, and they had a very long follow-up. What predicts recurrence? 
this is the big one that I cannot stress enough for anybody that's going to be doing sigmoid surgery in the future. The main predictor of recurrence is the level of the anastomosis. The absolute worst thing you can do to a patient like this is to spare the distal sigmoid colon to perform a colocolonic anastomosis. I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I see a lot of colocolonic anastomosis. Mayo Clinic looked at this and they had a 22% recurrence rate in colocolostomies compared to a 6.2% uh, recurrence in colorectostomies. Cleveland Clinic looked at the same thing, and their recurrence rate was 12.2% if they had a colocolonic anastomosis compared to 3% for colorectal anastomosis. Things that don't predict recurrence, though. Stable versus hand sewn has no impact on recurrence rate. The presence of a proximal colonic diverticula has no impact on recurrence rate. What that means is if they've got pan diverticulosis, that doesn't mean that the risk is different you can quote them the same numbers if they just had left-sided diverticulosis. Mobilizing the splenic flusher doesn't predict recurrence. Laparoscopic versus open surgery doesn't predict recurrence. So what does that mean? It means you're not going to see a lot of patients that need a repeat colectomy for recurrent diverticulitis after a sigmoidectomy. Probably less than half of a percent. If you do see it, though, it's quite possible it's because they got some residual sigmoid in there, distal to the anastomosis, and that should help you if you're planning surgery on that patient to make sure you you get distal enough uh, to prevent a third thing from happening. So this is the COSMIN trial. This is a study that's kind of uh, gonna hopefully answer a lot of these questions for us. It's a multi-center randomized controlled trial comparing best medical care to sigmoid colectomy to patients that have, who are asymptomatic after recurrent diverticulitis or they're experiencing ongoing symptoms for greater than three months after an index attack. So. This primary endpoint is appropriate, which is the GI quality life index. So it's probably gonna be completed in 2024. Hopefully we'll see data a, a year after that. So we're looking, we're only a few years away from having a better understanding of who should probably get surgery in the medical setting. So, all right, that's most of what I have to do. I got two minutes left. I just wanna put this out here. Uh, I don't know if you guys are in the robot surgery interest group uh, on Facebook, but I put a, a I put a question out here. If you've got an air leak from your staple of anastomosis, what do you do? And I, didn't, I then provided them with a ton of data that demonstrates that the safest thing to do if you don't want to have a leak is to redo the anastomosis. And even with the data right in front of them, less than 7% chose that option. The reason I bring that up is that you guys, more than anybody, are going to learn a lot from websites and social media. That's one of the great things about what you guys are doing here. But you gotta remember that expertise is not required to give an opinion. All you need is an audience, okay? And if you watch a lot of these videos, that's great. You can learn a lot. But keep in mind that that's not necessarily the right thing to do. And don't fall away from the right thing to do because it's easier, if that makes sense. For whatever reason, this really bothered me this week and so I had to bring it up. In conclusion, we're still figuring out this disease. Treatment is becoming more individualized with every study that comes out. Probably don't need antibiotics for uncomplicated disease. I think that's pretty clear. A lot of patients have chronic symptoms after uncomplicated diverticulitis and impact quality of life. Diverticular abscesses often require elective surgery than otherwise. So that's all I got. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Oh, yeah, there's someone left you after that. Sorry. Uh, Bartley's in town. Uh, how do I unshare my screen? There it is. Did I already share it? Uh, not yet. If you hit. Oh, there it is. Perfect. How, like how many years of Zoom before we get <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Langerfeld, for a, a terrific talk. We have a few questions, and then we'll uh, see what other questions are out there, too. A um, couple questions in the chat. Are there symptoms because of diverticulitis, or patients with these symptoms are likely to get diverticulitis since it's being considered more and more like an autoimmune kind of disease? Thanks. I don't um, know about cause and effect. I, I, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, Try and differentiate SCAD, you get the segmental colitis associated with diverticulitis from diverticulitis, which are two separate diseases. I, I, chicken and egg, I don't know. I would say that based on the fact that they get better with colectomy when you remove the diverticular disease, that would suggest that it is causative, if that makes sense, um, rather than just being associated with an autoimmune. If that was the case, then they would have recurrence in another segment of the colon afterwards. Sure. And then in the COSMIC study, does the best medical therapy include antibiotics? Say that again. 
in the cosmic in the cosmic study does does the best medical therapy include antibiotics oh good question so no best medical therapy is not suppressive antibiotics best medical therapy is just supportive care essentially uh, so they're randomized to either supportive care or uh or uh colectomy but whether or not they received antibiotics is, is sort of irrelevant because they've already recovered from that first episode when they get randomized so the ran the antibiotics you're not going to be a component of that decision, if that makes sense. Good question. Uh, another question is uh, numbers I've committed, 1% risk of malignancy and uncomplicated disease and up to 10% in complicated disease. Do you always do an oncologic resection for your diverticular disease? Non-anatomic depends on what it gives you. Great question from a very intelligent individual, Jesse. Good to see you. Uh, so what I would tell you is that in real life, you're not tricked nearly as often as you think you would be. Uh, you get referrals for diverticulitis that turn out to be cancer. That certainly happens. But if you've done a complete colonoscopy on that patient, the chance of you missing, the chance of you missing uh, a malignancy is very low. The same goes for CT scans. For CT scans, the old CT scans, they, we always said you have to do a colonoscopy because you're worried about missing a malignancy or you're mistaking diverticulitis, or mi mistaking a malignancy for diverticulitis. But with 1632 slice CT scanners, the sensitivity and specificity are both above 95%. And so the answer is no, I don't do routine oncologic resection for diverticular disease uh, in the sense of the, the level of the artery ligation if I've got my own colonoscopy. But there are times where you are a little bit suspicious, things are a little bit odd. And so I still do plenty of oncologic resections. It's just very unlikely that you'd, you'd be surprised by that finding on final pathology. You should probably be opening up your specimens and looking at them too, by the way. Yeah, I just really have a hard time with when I see people chop up these specimens and kind of throw them out through the rectum, but realistically, it's probably a safe practice. Um, Thank you. With that in mind, do you do your own colonoscopies on all your patients with diverticular disease? And when, when do you feel comfortable? Like, is it a year within a year, three years? What's your practice for that? That's so hard to answer. I, so first of all, most of the time, you can justify doing a colonoscopy on diverticulitis patients for one reason or another, either persistent symptoms, irregularity, thickening of the, of the wall on a CT scan. Maybe they're already 45 years old. Most of them are. But if they've had a recent high-quality colonoscopy, you don't have to do one again. Uh, I will say if it's a new diagnosis, I do, if that makes sense. Like if they had diverticulitis, they've been scoped, that's great. But you know, I need to look with my own eyes to make sure it's not a mass or, you know, you're not always just looking for cancer. You're also looking for IBD, uh, strictures, competing diagnoses, if that makes sense. And so that's, that's a good reason to do it. And then the risk of having like disease on the right side. So like if you do a diverticulitis colonoscopy, uh, the risk of having right side of pathology is very similar to uh, just a control group that didn't have diverticulitis. And when you say recent, is that a year, three years? What's kind of like your threshold for calling it recent, I guess? I, I think if you're going to do surgery, you're going to have to have something more recent than three to five years. Okay. You know what I mean? like, yeah. uh, but if you're planning to observe and they got a colonoscopy two or three years ago, it's high quality. It's not a new diagnosis. And they don't think you have to routinely do colonoscopy on that patient. Perfect. Um, we have another question. Do you send uncomplicated diverticulitis patients home without antibiotics? Well, that's a that's a that's hard, Avery. I'll tell you why. First of all, of course, when I'm talking to you guys, I do because I'm so brave. I'm on the podium right now. In real life is separate. The reality is we don't see a lot of patients in the ER. Our emergency general surgery does that, and so I'm not having a lot of opportunities to do it. But yeah, we've had success in select people that are doing well that just get sent home with supportive care. You're absolutely right, but it doesn't come up as much as you want. And I will admit, the first time I ever sent somebody home without antibiotics, it was viscerally very difficult for me. The patient did fine. And so uh, it is safe. It's just really hard. Dr. Langerfeld, do you know if um, a lot of primary care doctors and ER people, you know, across country, obviously it takes years for, you know, dogma to kind of change. Do you think we're kind of getting to that point where since like you've shown data now for almost 10 years where this has been going on for, do you think people are starting to hear about this more or it's just still? No, I think, I think that, you know, if you want to push the envelope, you probably should be able to back it up with data. I'm lucky, you know, I've already established myself as the expert, if that makes sense. And so since I'm the expert and I can say antibiotics not indicated, here's why, they'll accept it. 
you're the new guy that just started practice and you're building uh, referral patterns and you're getting to know people, just give them some augmentin. They'll be fine. The chance of getting T-diff is low. You don't want to be kind of, when you haven't demonstrated value yet, you don't want to be too crazy or off the wall because that's the tip of the spear, right? Is this stuff. But, uh, but uh, every you say, what should tell your residents? I think you should, I, don't, I think you should go over these trials with them. I would, I'd walk over the Diabolo trial and the two-year follow-up from that and then the functional uh, PRO stuff from that and, and have a discussion because realistically, it's not indicated and there, it's not a free lunch. Just look at how worthless, how worthless Levaquin is now, right? We can't use it on anything. Everything's resistant to Levaquin. Why? Because we gave it to a bunch of little old ladies in the early 2000s and every time they had a urinary tract infection. And so, uh, you know, some antibiotic stewardship was a big deal, if that makes sense, especially since we're typically giving uh, something like uh, Augmentin, beta lactam. You want that to work on the big stuff when you need it in the future. Perfect. And then uh, we have another question here that says, do you use mesalamine or try to prevent recurrent attacks or reduce symptoms in smoldering disease prior to resection? I don't. Mesalamine has never demonstrated, you know, value in prevention of recurrence. Uh, there's some value in the treatment of acute symptoms, if that makes sense. But the mesalamine data is pretty weak. Um, I did look at that. I gave a talk on kind of like that type of thing about five years ago. I don't think I've seen anything in the last couple of years on this. There is new data, guys. Please email it to me. But the mesalamine data I've seen is not convincing me of the fact where we're going to give it to anybody uh, on, on like a you know longitudinal basis to prevent recurrence or control symptoms. Perfect. Um, we'll give another minute or two for if there's any other questions, but to kind of summarize and, you know, if you have any other comments, Dr. Langenfeld, it seems like it seems like it's much more individualized approach for patient care now. Definitely not number of attacks has gone away. Um, and that it's kind of a discussion with patients regarding, you know, what they should be doing and you shouldn't yeah. be just doing it for the sake of doing it. So I, I think that the pendulum swung too far. I think that nobody does diverticular surgery anymore, if that makes sense. Um, we're letting people sit around with chronic symptoms for too long when the surgery does work. Um, and I think that that COSMIC trial is gonna help push people back towards a reasonable threshold for surgery. If people are going to the ER three times a year and you're like, well, you're not getting sick and they get better with antibiotics every time. Yeah, but they're going to the ER three times a year, especially in our current environment where the beds are overflowing and people are getting COVID and it just, you know, the reality is it does help. But um, yeah, the good, news, the good news is you can, you can really leave it in the patient's hands. There's good data that you can use to tell them, this is your risk of recurrence. This is what the recurrence is probably going to be like, right? And, and that puts them at ease. Every time I have a patient in clinic that's new to me for diverticulitis, especially if they've had it for a long time, the, the thing that they love to hear is that they can eat nuts and seeds and popcorn. Mm -hmm. You'd be shocked how many patients have been self-avoiding or been told by their primary doctor that can't have that anymore. Um, and you just, you're the uh, hero in their eyes when you tell them, yeah, go get some sesame seeds on the way home. You know, it, it just, it, it, whatever. It, it just, it's really silly that, uh, that that's so widespread. And that's dogma too. And that's taking, so how long has that data been out? It, it, 2008. So mm -hmm. it's taken 14 years to get that out. So antibiotics doesn't take. Sure. Sure. Longer than that. And so for patients that you're kind of watching or you're kind of following, do you have an algorithm for like when you see these patients back or do you also tailor it back to patient kind of centered for when they want to be seen back? If somebody you're like, you know what, we can kind of hold off on doing surgery for you. Yeah, I do. I do actually bring them back. So after I've had that diverticulitis discussion in the office, well, this is like a, this is a building of practice. So this is important for you guys to know. Saying no has consequences. You get referred a patient for diverticulitis and you say, doesn't need surgery. And then you just send the patient on his merry way. The problem is that patient is calling the primary doc with pain, they need antibiotics, and they're annoyed because they sent it to you to fix the problem and it's still their problem. You can't help them. Maybe somebody else can. And so whenever you say no to somebody, you don't go, no thanks to send it back. What you do is you say, I don't think they need surgery right now. But moving forward, this is my problem if it happens again. Uh, if they'll call me next time they have pain. And I'm going to follow them longitudinally over time to decide if surgery is going to help them or not. Sure. And sure. so the best way that I do that is I typically have the patient come back about three to six months 
minutes after that first discussion so we can say, how you been feeling? Have you had any problems? I, I assess for chronic symptoms. And if they're not, I say, call me when you need me. Sure. And the reality is most of them don't call. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they're going to Methodist. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, with that, I guess uh, we'll be respectful of everybody's time. And of course, yours, Dr. Langerfeld. Thank you again for an amazing talk. Um, we'll open it up for one last call for any other questions. And if that, we'll um, call it a night. And thank you again, Dr. Langerfeld, for your time and your expertise. We really appreciate it. So Happy to do it. Appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you so much.